Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the, the Jerusalem Fund and our educational program, the Palestine Center. And a welcome also to our online audience. My name is Zena Azam. I'm the executive director here. On behalf of the fund's board and staff, I'd like to welcome you all to our annual Hisham Sharabi Memorial Lecture. A special welcome goes to Dr. Fuad Mughrabi, our distinguished lecturer today. We're so pleased to have you with us. This memorial lecture is named after Professor Hisham Sharabi, who was one of the co-founders of our organization, the, pa the Jerusalem Fund for Education and Community Development. Dr. Sharabi served as the chairman of our board of directors from 1977, when the fund was founded, until his death in 2005. Through this event, we honor the memory and vast body of work of Hisham Sharabi. From 1953 to 1998, and that's 45 years, he was professor of European intellectual history at Georgetown University, where he also held the Omar al-Mukhtar Chair of Arab Culture. Dr. Sharabi was one of the founders in 1975 of Georgetown Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, one of the premier institutions of its kind in the United States. It's, we're fortunate to have Dr. Judith Tucker and Dr. Halim Barakat, who are, um, have been long associated with that center. Um, indeed, Dr. Sharabi devoted much of his professional energies toward building institutions of public, public education and advocacy for Palestine. Hisham Sharabi was from Jaffa, the Palestinian city. In 1998, he wrote the following. In Jaffa, one of my favorite places as a small boy was the city's ancient harbor. I visited the harbor when I went back in the fall of 1993. Standing where I often stood so many years ago, I felt only the bitterness and anger all Palestinians feel when they go back to where they were born and where their grandparents were born and spent their lives before becoming refugees. I try to remind myself of what sustained all Palestinian refugees over the long years of exile. This land is not a memory. It is not lost. It is out there where it can be seen and touched, a patrimony that can never be given up or taken away. Today, Fuad Mughrabi will be talking to us about the role of education in the survival and flourishing of the Palestinian community. He will examine the problems facing Palestinian education under occupation and prospects for the future. Dr. Mughrabi will explore questions like, what reforms are needed in the Palestinian educational system? How can Palestinian institutions cope with the problems of military occupation? What does a successful educational institution look like? And what is the role of Palestinian civil society? We will have a question and discussion period at the end, and our live stream audience can send questions via Twitter on at Palestine Center. And those online and in our audience can also join the conversation on Twitter using hashtag, um, hashtag HSML16, that's Hisham Sharabi Memorial Lecture, HSML16. So that, let me now introduce our speaker more fully. Dr. Fuad Mughribi is Emeritus Professor of Political Science and former department head at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. He has written extensively in the areas of Middle East studies and political psychology. He returned to Palestine in 1999 to establish the Qatan Center for Educational Research and Development, where he served as director until 2004 and then as senior advisor. Previously, he served as a Fulbright visiting professor at Birzeit University and worked with the late professor Ibrahim Abu Lughud on the first Palestinian educational curriculum project. Professor Mughrabi holds a BA and an MA in political science from Duke University and a PhD in political science from the University of Grenoble, France. His works have appeared in various journals, including the International Journal of Middle East Studies, the Middle East Journal, the Journal of Palestine Studies, Theory and Society, Social Justice, and Radical History Review. In addition, he has conducted numerous public opinion polls and with Gallup, the Survey Research Center, 
<coughs> and other organizations on U.S. attitudes toward the Middle East. He is co-author of the book Public Opinion and the Palestine Question, which was published by St. Martin, Martin's Press. Dr. Mogherabi's talk is titled Palestinian Education for the 21st Century. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Zena. Um, I'm especially happy to be here today because, uh, bec for a variety of reasons, but one in particular, and I'll, I have to share it with you. Um, when I was a junior at Duke University, sometime around 1963, uh, one of my teachers at the time, <coughs> a man called Proctor Harris, decided to convene a small conference on the Middle East. And he invited a number of people. And uh, he invited Hisham Sharabi, who was at Georgetown at the time. And uh, they asked me to go meet him, pick him up at the airport, and show him around, and so on, which I did. And I remember sitting there in the audience, listening to Professor Sharabi. And uh, I was, I still remember it distinctly. I remember the feeling I had. I was so impressed. Uh, and in awe of the brilliance that he showed in his presentation and his comments and his questions and so on. And I remember saying to myself, when I grow up, that's what I'm going to be like. And years later, I remember telling him this <coughs> when he, we, we became colleagues and worked on different things together. I remember telling him that he was very flattered to hear that. The last time I saw Hisham was uh, in Yaffa uh, at the Ibrahim of Lord's funeral. We, uh, this is a long story which merits telling by itself, but uh, uh, we uh, took the body from Jerusalem to Yaffa because he wanted to be buried in Yaffa. Two weeks before he died, uh, he had a he was on an oxygen tank, and he had tubes in his nose, and so on. He called me, and he said, can, you, can we go to the sea? I said, sure. So I went, and my wife and my son at the time, and we picked him up, and we drove to Yaffa. Back in those days, it was easy to drive straight through without going through checkpoints. And so we got to the sea, and there's a spot where he liked to be, and he used to swim as a young man. So we sat at, at, on, the, on, the, on the ledge there, and uh, my wife and my son went and played in the water. And we chatted for a while. And then when it was time to leave, he says, the cemetery, the Muslim cemetery, is right, oh, sorry, right on the side, on the corner, right, right next to that spot where we were. He says, you know, my father and my brother are buried here. I said, yes, I know. He says, and me too. I said, oh, OK. He says, but you have to promise. I said, I promise. Don't worry about it. It'll, uh, it will happen. It was a fairly co complicated uh, uh, story. But in the end, we succeeded in, in, in getting him buried in, in Yaffa. But as we were walking down to towards the cemetery, I saw Hisham, and he was standing there looking kind of distraught. So he came over, and we, we, we hugged and chatted, and he walked with me. And uh, then people who were sitting there, this is the Arab quarter, asked, who, whose funeral is this? And I said, this is Ibrahim Abulod's funeral. Oh, he's one of us. He's from, he's from Yaffa. He's Ibn Yaffa. I said, yes. So they all got out of their houses, and they joined the, f the, s the funeral march. And then all of a sudden, Palestinian flags emerged. And all of a sudden, the Israelis in the midst were infiltrating, you know, jumped around, started taking snapping pictures and so on, and they went crazy. Uh, but it became a, 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 an emotional nationalist demonstration uh, where somebody was uh, exercising his right to return uh, to be buried in his hometown. 
and uh, anyhow, uh, what I'm going to talk about is education, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a, I decided it's a tribute, it's a nice tribute to Hisham and his memory, mainly because education was a, you know, was important to him, but also because institution building was important to him, and I think that is an important issue. So I'll talk about education in general, and I'll talk a little bit about what I did with the Qatan Foundation in, uh, in Ramallah. I begin by a quotation from the Higher Committee <coughs> for Review of the Process of Palestinian Education. This is a recent report by a committee, a ministerial committee, that was set up and took two years of deliberations uh, to study uh, the situation in, uh, in educational situation and the process, and to make some recommendations. And the basic conclusion is the following. Education, as it currently stands, fails to meet the universally acknowledged criteria of quality and is in dire need of reform in all of its aspects. It's widely acknowledged that Palestinian education is in a state of crisis and needs comprehensive and radical reform. And this was the conclusion of this ministerial committee. At the same time, everyone knows what needs to be done to improve Palestinian education and how important a knowledge society is for any meaningful and sustainable economic development. The committee, consisting of some of the best and the brightest, deliberated for two years, held hearings, and reviewed data, in-depth reports, and studies. They made a number of concrete and innovative recommendations for reforming the educational system in all of its aspects, including, by the way, eliminating the Tawjihi exam, which is a very controversial thing and would have been a... Uh, but uh, Sabri Saidam, Dr. Sabri Saidam, one of the active members of this committee, a well-educated and very competent person, who was an ardent advocate for reform, was then appointed Minister of Education. The question then is, why is nothing being done? One obvious reason relates to the political paralysis and abysmal failure that characterizes Palestinian politics under Israeli occupation. Palestinians are deeply divided, as you know, between Fatah in the West Bank and Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Despite occasional half-hearted attempts at reunification, the division appears more and more deeply entrenched. In the second place, the current leadership is now increasingly discredited and lacks any legitimacy in the eyes of its people. Predicting the collapse of the national authority, Palestinian national authority, is now commonplace. The question is when? The PNA is faced with a declining budget and the shrinking of donor money as a result of donor fatigue, complaints about misappropriation of funds, and the lack of progress toward ending the conflict. Therefore, its ability to govern and to sustain a bloated bureaucracy is in serious doubt. It is kept on life support mainly because Israel prefers it this way. In the third place, the Israeli occupation is clearly moving in the direction of full-fledged annexation at the level of daily reality. Israel continues to, f to confiscate private Palestinian land and to build more settlements without fanfare and without making general proclamations. Step by step, Israel establishes facts on the ground in much the same way as the Zionist uh, movement has done throughout its history, except now it is done in broad daylight. Finally, for a variety of reasons, the so-called international community, mainly the U.S. and Europe, appears to be reluctant to, adapt, to adopt any serious measures that would force an end to Israel's creeping annexation. Um, the, of Palestinian lands, the uh, Judaization of Jerusalem, and the savage daily attacks by the settlers. At the Palestinian level, there is a realization that the faint promise of Oslo 
has proven to be no more than a mirage. Oslo is dead, and the prospect of a settlement based on a two-state solution is also gone. A new era of struggle has begun, and it may take some time before things begin to change. In the meanwhile, Palestinian resistance is likely to go on and may assume various forms. Some of these include a sharp increase in support for the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement at the international level. These efforts are sophisticated and well-managed and are already yielding significant results to the extent that Israelis are now talking openly about targeted assassinations of PDS activists. Other forms of struggle include the random individual acts of violence by young people that tend to be more desperate acts resulting from deep frustration and loss of hope. All this adds up to the following. Israel is likely to pay a high price for its continuing subjugation and mistreatment of the Palestinian people and will live in a heightened state of insecurity and fear as long as the occupation persists. Under these conditions, it is difficult to see how any significant political initiatives can be undertaken. However, education does present a rare opportunity for the PNA to undertake major reforms that could significantly boost its shattered image among the population. The Palestinians in general place a very high premium on education and are willing to make huge sacrifices to make sure their sons and daughters receive an excellent education. Given declining resources and the loss of land, investing in the only available asset, namely human beings, becomes the most vital necessity. It is by now well known that educational reform is absolutely critical for economic development. And there are many examples throughout the world to show that. One would have thought, therefore, that education and not the various security agencies would have been given the highest priority in any budget. Sadly, this has not been the case. The education budget was given a substantial boost in the early period following the Oslo Accords by various donor countries as well as international agencies. The funds were used to upgrade a decaying system or infrastructure that was ignored during the years when Israel was in control to keep up with population growth, to hire and train new teachers, and to begin producing new textbooks. In general, and to be fair, the record, PRP, the Palestinian National Authority record, ha has so far been a mixed one. Some notable achievements were made under extremely difficult circumstances. I recall the period of the Second Intifada when schools were closed for long periods, Israeli tanks and armored personnel carriers roamed the streets of the major cities. Teachers, as well as students, had to find alternate routes to avoid checkpoints. The Israeli army entered the Ministry of Education building in Ramallah and ransacked offices, destroyed computers, and so on. To his credit, Dr. Naim Abul Hobbos the Minister of Education at the time and his dedicated staff worked tirelessly to keep the system going and to make sure that students sit for their final exams and graduate on time. At the same time, mistakes were made and opportunities were missed. The very first thing the PNA did upon assuming control of education in 1994 was to th throw out the excellent curricular recommendations submitted by a task force led by the late Professor Ibrahim Abloud, whose project was funded by UNESCO. He assembled an excellent team of dedicated professionals who were able to produce a sophisticated blueprint for a modern, secular, and innovative curriculum for Palestinian education. Instead, the PNA appointed its own team, led by a mediocre education professor who happened to be a Muslim fundamentalist, they produced mediocre textbooks that were hailed as a great achievement in Palestinian education, replacing old Jordanian textbooks in use in the West Bank and Egyptian textbooks in use in the Gaza Strip. 
The bulk of the budget, of the PNA budget, was devoted to funding the huge bureaucracy that was set up to run various <coughs> ministries. The security services received some 28% of the budget, while education, including higher education, received only 18%. Additional funding came from donor countries or agencies, such as the World Bank, UNESCO, and so on. To their credit, the PNA was able to maintain the educational system and so on. The new curriculum mandated, this is another positive thing in the new curriculum that they did, and probably the only one that I know of, the new curriculum mandated that English language be taught beginning with the first grade. This was the, the first curriculum uh, uh, committee recommended that, and that, that was, we thought, was, was extremely important. In later years, other languages such as French and Hebrew were offered as well. When I taught at Beer's Aid, it was funny because this is 95, 96, I was a Fulbright visiting professor, and I taught, the, you know, you're supposed to teach in Arabic, but all the uh, resources that the students had to read were in English, because there was very little translated material. And, and, and there were varied levels of competency in English. But now, uh, now I imagine that the students, if I were to go back and teach at this, at this particular moment, I would find that most of them would be able to read the English material fairly well. Uh, but back in 95 and 96, they weren't, because they started learning English in the fourth grade. So that's a, a fairly significant uh, achievement. And by the way, I have, in my own school, we have an ESL program, and it's full of Saudi students. Now, give me a break. I mean, with all the incredible resources, how they graduate students who need to have further training in English language before they are admitted to university. In, in Saudi Arabia, which has <laughs> all the resources you can imagine. But we don't have that problem. The results are somewhat encouraging, and, the, and three in particular are worth noting. One is that the literacy rate, the literacy rate among the population now stands at 91.9%, which is the highest in the Arab world. And the rate is 98.2% among 15 to 24 four-year-olds. The UN's education index lists Palestine with the lowest GDP, gross uh, domestic product, at 0 0.88, and Qatar <laughs> with the highest GDP at 0 0.87. So we actually do much better than Qatar with immensely more resources. Um, Another important criterion comes from the results of the TIMSS test, T-I-M-S-S, -S, that's Trends in International Mathematics and Science Study. This is an international test that is given to a variety of countries uh, willing to take it at the fourth and eighth grade levels. In 2003, Palestinian public schools scored 427 average. UNRWA schools, because you know, there are the public schools, and then there are other schools run by the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, and then there are the private schools. So 427 for the public schools run by the ministry. UNRWA schools scored average 444, and the private schools 4 491. To put these scores in perspective, the U.S. scored 527, 527, while Jordan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Lebanon scored 475, 421, and 398. Uh, so we did significantly better than, um, than both uh, uh, Lebanon and, and Saudi Arabia. Um, a little bit, uh, and, 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 and Egypt, and a little bit less than, than Jordan. Um, Palestinian graduates are, in general, are reasonably fluent in English and do well in higher education. Some of the graduates of the private schools, such as the French School in Ramallah, are accepted at elite American universities, uh, usually with full scholarships, and usually distinguish themselves. By now, it is fairly well established that the Palestinians have one of the highest rates of university graduates in the world. On the negative side, Palestinian bureaucrats have become adept at using terms in vogue in order to impress international donors. They often talk about decentralization, 
even if they set even as they set up a highly centralized system. They talk about moving away from the banking system of lineage. Banking, in other words, uh, this is a term that goes comes from Paolo Freire's uh, work about how knowledge is. I have knowledge, and I'm filling it in the in the brains of the students. This is the banking system by memorization and rote learning and so on. So they talk about moving away from the banking system of knowledge and pay lip service to critical thinking and problem solving, even as they establish a curriculum based on rote learning and memorization. They talk about teacher training and development, even as they set up programs that have little to do with what teachers actually need in their classrooms. They talk about the central role of the teacher while they set up a system of inspectors who act as if teachers are guilty until proven innocent. And in our discussions with teachers at the Qatan Foundation, this comes up over and over again, that these inspectors come to the school unannounced, and they come looking for problems in order to punish. Um, and they make life hell for them. All of these contradictions emerge from extensive focus group discussions that were carried out by the Qatan Center for Educational Research and Development with school, teacher, school teachers in the early period between 99 and 2004, and nothing has changed since then. Um, the few accomplishments and important gains that characterized the Oslo period gradually began to be reversed. With the possible exception of Naim of Hummus, most of the ministers of education have been weak and ineffective. It seemed for all practical purposes was edu that education was relatively ignored and had become a heavily bureaucratized routine operation. The status of teachers began to decline even further. For a number of years, teachers would often go for months without receiving their salaries, and many of them were forced to look for additional jobs in order to make ends meet. Imagine students, and this happened over, uh, over and over again, and we hear stories like that all the time. Imagine uh, students getting in a taxi only to find that their teacher is driving it. It is no accident that they recently went on a long strike, a long strike, demanding better wages and work conditions. And they demanded the central issue was they wanted to be treated with dignity, more, more than money. They just wanted to be treated with dignity. And the term dignity became central for their demands. The strike brought together teachers who belonged to Fatah, Habas, independence, and so on, regardless of their political. They all got together, and they held fast to the strike. Uh, and, and the strike, by the way, received fairly substantial support among the public and dealt with very, very poorly by the Palestinian Authority. Historically, one, some, one of the unique aspects of contemporary history is that Palestinian civil society always intervened to rescue education and to make it available for the youth. For example, during the years of the mandate, these are interesting stories, villagers would raise funds in order to add rooms to schools or to build new schools for their children as a way of compensating for the failure of the mandate authorities to invest in education. That happened over and over again. In the years following the Nakba, it was common to see students studying under street lights, which we did, I'm sure you did too, because we didn't have electricity, until late into the night. Furthermore, Palestinians as volunteers set up an alternative system of education during the first intifada when the Israeli authorities closed schools for a long periods of time. In fact, the full story of, the, of Palestinian struggle for the right to education remains to be told in its fullest details. Im images of school children going through and around checkpoints or climbing through fences and holes in the wall at great risk to their lives to reach their school are commonplace. This is indeed a story of heroism, sacrifice, and determination that I think is unparalleled in the modern world. 
Palestinian teachers always played a significant role in, inter in, in, in nationalist education and nation building. Well-known teachers like Abdul Latif Tribawi, Khalil Sakakini, Ahmed Samih Al Khaldi played a key and pioneering role in educational reform. One of the things I decided to do when in, in building the, the, the center was to reproduce, re, re, uh, republish some of these books. So we republished uh, Ahmed Samih Al Khaldi's book on education. And when you read that book, which was, I think, 19. 39, I'm not sure the exact date when he put it out, 39 maybe, or even before. When you read it, it is phenomenal how progressive and how, how modern and the ideas, how brilliant and how, you know, they were influenced by people like Dewey, for example. And you realize that they were open to the rest of the world in a very, very sophisticated way. And then you, say, you, you, then you wonder, what the hell did happen, uh, you know? And of course, we know what happened. And, and, but if things had developed in a normal way, Palestine would be a leading place for education in, in the Arab world. Um, the, Arab, the famous Arab college graduated teachers who, who played an important role in Palestinian civil society. And some of them, by the way, went on to build societies uh, in, in the oil-rich countries in the Gulf during the 1950s. The first labor force, skilled manpower, came from that group, graduates of the Arab College. In the absence of state control, much of the accomplishment made by the Palestinians often occurred in the area of civil society. This is as true now as it has been for years, since the mandate. I'll briefly examine one such effort. I agreed to return to Palestine to establish the Qatan Center in 1999, in the fall of 1999. A general conceptual framework was provided by two consultants from Oxford University's Department of Education and served as a point of departure. With the assistance of my friend and late colleague, Ibrahim Abulod, I began to hire a small team of teachers as potential researchers who were highly recommended by various people. It was quickly obvious that there was a scarcity of competent, already qualified people. But we decided to look for capable young men and women and try to give them the proper training and to give them the opportunity to send them overseas and so on. I met with dozens of educators and community leaders in order to identify needs and problem areas. I also tried to familiarize myself with similar experiments in India, Brazil, South Africa, Namibia, and some European countries. But in particular, India, Brazil, South Africa, and Namibia. Theoretically, our work was inspired by the rich legacy of the Brazilian educator, Paulo Freire, and his disciples, most notably Carlos Torres of UCLA, the late Maxine Green from Teachers College in New York, we translated her superb book, Releasing the Imagination, and made it available to our teachers. And Michael Apple from the University of Wisconsin, whose superb work on the curriculum offered us unparalleled guidance. We decided after considerable deliberations that improving teacher performance and knowledge in substantive areas are the key components in the process of improving education. Therefore, the question became how to organize a research center that would contribute to developing the role of teachers. It was important for us that the research agenda would flow from the bottom up, and therefore we held extensive focus group discussions with teachers, with various types of teachers, in order to identify problem areas, possible solutions, and then come up with a research agenda. Initially, we adopted action research as a key tool. And this was important for a number of reasons. In the first place, this research tool sets the researcher and the object of his, her research on an equal level. And therefore, it forces them to adopt a certain amount of humility. This was a novelty in our patriarchal culture obviously, but it was important to instill humility among the researchers. You don't want 
people to say, okay, I have, I have the knowledge and I'm going to share it with you and I'm going to give it to you and so on. No, we work together on an equal footing and try to identify problems and solutions. The research does not come in and with superior knowledge that he or she wants to impart. In the second place, it encourages teachers to begin to think of themselves and to act as research practitioners. And in the third place, which is extremely important in my opinion, it establishes a common language, a new language, uh, among these practitioners as well as a common frame of reference. We would videotape teachers in their classrooms who were engaged in actual research, and we began to accumulate a wealth of material that we highlighted at annual conferences where teachers talked about their experiences to other teachers. So we brought these teachers together, we videotaped, we, we found best practices and so on, and, and, and gave them the attention they deserved. We also published in our newsletter narratives written by teachers who were involved in actual research. The center quickly accumulated a rich archive and contains data, including videotapes of teachers doing actual research, in addition to hundreds of taped hours of focus group discussions and so on. The center has also developed a unique program in the use of drama in education. Every year, and this is I think the 10th or 12th year, that a summer school three-year program is offered for carefully selected teachers from the West Bank, Gaza Strip, within the Green Line, Jordan, Lebanon, and so on. They do it in Jarish, in a beautiful place in Jarish. A number of distinguished educators and experts in the field come from the UK, Greece, and elsewhere. Some of the graduates have become accomplished teachers and are able to uh, conduct workshops for, their, for other teachers throughout these various areas. So they're now train, trainers for other teachers. A few years ago, the foundation received additional funding to expand the science education track and to train science teachers according to modern standards. In addition, there is an ambitious plan to establish an interactive science museum in Palestine. There are several museums now. Palestine Museum is opening uh, on May 15th. It's a beautiful, beautiful project that you can go and see it on the website. Uh, another museum uh, that I'll, I'll talk about in a minute, in, in Bethlehem, uh, a, a, a botanical garden and biodiversity uh, uh, Museum of Natural History uh, that Mazen Komsiya has, has, has put together, and um, and then this is in the this project is now uh, on uh, fairly well along the way, and we have a team. By the way, we have a team, young men and women, who are in San Francisco now at the Exploratorium, learning uh, how to do how to make things for the museum. Uh, in order to illustrate scientific concepts and so on. And they'll be there for the rest of the summer. And we also, we also, uh, I was able to raise enough money to send some teachers uh, for master's degrees in, to various places to study museology. Museology. I didn't know about the existence of that specialty until we started digging. Muse a degree in museology. Who would have thought that you'd get a degree in museology? But it's fantastic. It's important. So you have to have trained people to be able to run these, these, uh, these things. Uh, and, and, and so we will have uh, the number of people who are able to do so. Um, one of the, uh, the young men who's, who's directing the science education track is, is, is one of the first hires I made. And I, he came to the US and did his PhD at the University of Illinois. And uh, I ran into his advisor at one of the conferences, and he says, please, please send me more. You know, this is a young man who made nothing but straight A's, and he's fantastic. And he's, yeah. So he came back. He's running this science track. And uh, one of the, there was a recent story about some of the things. There's a young woman called Vivian Samsur. Uh, you may have seen uh, something uh, on Facebook about her. Uh, they're, they're setting up a seed bank, seed bank. There's a lot of, a lot of plants and seeds are, are becoming extinct. And uh, so they're setting up a seed bank. And uh, there was a story in The Guardian about this on April 23rd that you may want to look up. It's, it's fascinating. It's a fascinating thing. 
and but she's she's she works with this project at the Qatan uh, Center, and it's something that uh, we're very proud of. Um, initially, our work was concentrated in the Ramallah area, and of course, we opened a parallel office in Gaza. After a while, however, our research team often traveled to various parts of the West Bank in order to conduct workshops and so on. And in the early period, we had no problem going to Gaza and to do training and workshops and so on, but then things fell apart and it became very difficult, so we stopped doing that. And we started compensating by video conferences, but it's not the same. Um, our contact with teachers through workshops began to grow. Furthermore, we built an extensive library, we have a fairly substantial library, specialized library in education, where teachers and graduate students, as well as educators, come for assistance, and it's heavily used. Eventually, something unexpected and reassuring happened, and it's just something we did not expect, because I was worried, how are we going to, we don't have unlimited resources, how are we going to make it, we can't stay in Ramallah only, and how are we going to go? to Jericho and Hebrew and so on and so on. And what happened eventually is that um, on their own initiatives, teachers established clubs, what they call a muntada in Arabic, where they gathered periodically to discuss issues of common interest, to discuss new books, to see new educational films and so on. We provided them with some assistance and supplied them teaching material, videotapes. Um, and other resources. I appointed somebody in charge of coordinating uh, 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 matters with them, with, with these muntadas, these clubs. But we tried not to interfere, not to interfere in, their in, in their internal affairs. Um, so we just let them do their own thing, but we gave them assistance. And therefore, they became our, our uh, reproductions of our work in various parts of the West Bank. In addition, <coughs> the Qatan Foundation inaugurated three other important programs. One is the Center for the Child in Gaza which houses an extensive library for children until the age of 15, in addition to a computer center, arts and crafts, and so on. And then there's a music school in Gaza as well. And these remained functioning even during the, the attacks, the Israeli attacks. Um, furthermore, <coughs> the foundation has an arts and culture program that identifies talented youth in different areas, literature, music, uh, theater, the arts, poetry, and so on, fiction, holds competitions and awards prizes for excellence. We, we appoint committees, you know, Kamal Bellata served on the committee, I remember, uh, Elias Houri served on the committee for, a, a number of distinguished people are asked to serve on these, as to be the jury to choose among the uh, competitors. And a number of young Palestinian artists and writers have emerged through this program. Recently, for example, I logged onto a website called Words Without Borders. I don't know if you know, you know that. Uh, which publishes reviews of literature from various parts of the world. I was pleasantly surprised to see a review of a new novel by a young woman called Adaniya Shibli. Did you see that? Adaniya Shibli is... Uh, is a Bedouin, young Bedouin woman from inside, from Palestinians and the inside. And she won the first prize for fiction, the first, one of the first competitions. Now she's on her third book, I think, and her books are being translated in all kinds of languages, and she lives in Berlin. Um, and then there are a number of other stories of success that, that I can cite as well. And they're building a new uh, state-of-the-art cultural center in Ramallah that will house all of these activities. Um, there are other, no less important agencies in, uh, I mean, I can talk endlessly uh, uh, about our activities and our work, uh, but that I just thought I'd give you a, sn a snapshot. 
There are other, no less important agencies in civil society that are actively involved in the field of education, culture, and the arts. And one in particular is noteworthy. That's Mazen Komsiya, by the way. You, you heard of him. He's one of the leading geneticists in the world. And I'm not exaggerating. And this is by testimony from all kinds of people. Um, and he served as, I got to know him when he came to Tennessee to be the director of the genetics lab in Chattanooga. And so I, then after that he went to Duke University to run the genetics lab, and, for, and after that he went to Yale to run, the, and then he decided to go back in 2008. And he comes from Beit Sahur. For some reason, Beit Sahur, the water in Beit Sahur is special. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody uh, achieves incredibly in education, extremely talented people. They, they become famous. Uh, they do wonderful things. Um, he teaches at Bethlehem and Beer Zayt Universities. In 2014, he and his wife contributed their own funds to establish the Palestinian Institute of Biodiversity Research, as well as a Museum of Natural History. You can see it all, Palestine Nature, one word, dot org. These centers run mostly by local and visiting foreign volunteers, aim to explore and research the diversity of fauna, flora, and human ethnography via collections and research, to promote environmental awareness through responsible interaction between people and their environment. It's very badly needed, I assure you. To encourage science research and spread science education and to create a number of databases. In contrast to the political paralysis and the lack of hope on the horizon, Palestinian civil society is very much alive. And this is actually the good story. Always active, and always innovative. To a large extent, you'd be pleased to know, Ramallah it has become a busy and thriving cultural center of Palestinian life, probably more so than any other Arab capital. If you go there and you see that little publication, This Week in Palestine, there's a beautiful little publication about events This called This Week, you'd be at a loss to decide where to go and what to do. There's so much, so much offered in theater, in dance, in music, in poetry, in the, uh, all you name it. It's a very, very busy, lively cultural scene. Uh, the result has been significant in many ways. Refusing to give up and to abandon hope talented young Palestinian artists, filmmakers, writers, poets, and theater producers are now making a new contribution to the redefinition of Palestinian identity. Their work is making inroads throughout the world, and a new Palestinian voice is now being heard. Attendance at Palestine film festivals is quite high, and so is attendance at art exhibits or music performances. These events are well covered by the elite press in Europe and North America. Something unique has occurred as a result. Palestine is no longer simply a local distant problem of victims, refugees, and people under occupation. It has become a universal metaphor for freedom and justice. So to try to conclude all this, uh, what needs to be done? One cannot underestimate the need for major reforms. The bulk of Palestinian youth do not have access to the work of the various agencies actively involved in civil society. The latter do not have the resources to cover the huge needs of the educational system. Thousands of student, students graduate from university and cannot find employment. The universities are underfunded and declining in their offerings as well as their standards. I think the time has come for educators and activists to agree on a timetable, and this I think is regardless of the political, I think we should not let the political situation affect what, determine what we do. 
regardless. I think the time has come to agree on a timetable for the implementation of the recommendations of the Ministerial Committee. The Ministry cannot and should not try to do it by itself. It's impossible. It has to enter into partnership with those in civil society who have been fully engaged in providing for the educational needs of the Palestinian people. It is a matter of survival for Palestinian society. Whether the Palestinians end up as a permanent underclass living in ghettos, or whether they are able to enter the modern world as proud, active citizens who shape their own destiny in their own country. Failure at the level of politics often leads to frustration and to cynical calls to dismantle the Palestinian Authority. Yet, the fact is that important structures have been put in place to manage areas of public life, such as education, health care, and so on. These structures should be improved upon and expanded rather than dismantled. Furthermore, educational reform cannot wait for the political situation to sort itself out. The Qatar Center, for example, for Educational Research and Development should aim to become a national center of advanced research and training while maintaining its total independence. In the beginning, you know, they tried to, to kind of sneak themselves in to, to try to see what they can. And I would get calls on a regular basis from Arafat's office. The president wants to come visit your place. Oh, no, 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 I don't want to. No. I resisted totally. They would try to use Brahim Abulo to force me to, and, I, and he resisted, and I resisted him. I resisted, and, and uh, he, he never came, because I did not want our work to be politicized for any reason. I, I, I could care less about his visit, anyhow. Um, so the center should become an advanced, uh, an advanced national center of advanced research and training while maintaining its total independence. It should also work closely with the ministry and others as a think tank, a place where applied research and education can lead the way forward towards establishing a true knowledge society in the Arab world, in, in Palestine. And the final note is something I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do. Um, we talked about it before, and I think the time has come for us to to be serious about it, uh, and that is to, to launch a worldwide campaign to encourage educators and professionals in various fields to come to Palestine as volunteers in order to help improve the quality of Palestinian education. This is where Palestinians in the diaspora, as well as important centers such as this, can help lead the way. I'll be submitting a detailed proposal to the Qatan Foundation recommending that we sponsor this project. I imagine you know, something like a Peace Corps kind of thing, uh, but Teach for Palestine, where a retired principal can come and be attached to a school to help a Palestinian principal, and so a uh, retired chemistry teacher or somebody wants to go spend a semester or a year attached to a chemistry teacher, and so on. You know, that kind of enrichment and that kind of connection and opening us, ourselves to the rest of the world and, uh, and, and I think that time has come for us to do that seriously. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Fuad, for a wonderful lecture. But <clears throat> I have one question. I mean, uh, you talked about the plan, and it seemed like a very, you know, sophisticated, perfect plan. But isn't there a problem always with kind of, you know, doing the top? plan and kind sure, of sure. looking at reality sure, sure. and uh, sure. kind of uh, sure. maybe a midway plan or something. Sure, sure, sure. I think, yes, I think, yes. Yeah. Okay, I have a question. Can you kind of repeat the question? Well, you know, the, his question is, is the, the plans are general and so on, and, you know, is there, is there a way to, to begin by doing something more focused and more limited? And I agree, I fully agree. But the plan actually does call for uh, stages. Uh, for example, the, in, in his interviews, in the interviews, uh, Sabri Salem talks about eliminating the Tawjih. In my opinion, eliminating the Tawjih should be down the road. It's not the priority. It's a horrible exam, I'm, I know. 
Um, and it's an exam that culminates a, a, a whole experience in m rote learning and memorization and so on. Um, by no means critical thinking and problem solving. But it should be at the, down the road. It should be the result of a series of, of, uh, of uh, for example, they may have a good text in the in the curriculum in the textbook. They they probably have in some cases they have good text, or the teachers are able to introduce their own text. And we published something, uh, the Katans have published something, uh, where we selected texts, alternative texts, and showed them how to actually use these texts as supplementary material and so on, and what kinds of questions to ask. Now, the problem is not the choice of the text itself for the students to read. The problem is with the questions, <laughs> and the, the stupid questions. I mean, they're, I'll show you, the questions they ask, they ask, do you remember, what year did some, something happen? Or what, or who, was, who was the guy, who, who was the person who, you know, nonsense like that. It's all the banking system. They can't get away from it. So one thing to begin with, for example, is to go, to have a small group of people come up with, you know, w what kinds of questions do you ask in order, if you're going to do critical thinking and problem solving and so on, what kinds of questions do you ask uh, from, about a text for Arabic language at the eighth grade level, for example. So there are little things that can be done, focused things that can be done, but that, that will eventually add up to a whole lot of big things that eventually will make this exam totally irrelevant. Uh, some schools, uh, the, the French school, by the way, has introduced the IB program now. Uh, and I think some other schools are thinking of doing the same thing. But the IB program is a very good program. And, uh, and you know, when, when, if they go through that program, they, they can go anywhere in the world and, and, and do extremely well. But. Uh, but the rest of them don't have access to that, and it's still still the same. It's easy for teachers to do that, the system as it is. Um, so there are focused, small things that can and should be done that eventually will add up to all things. But you're absolutely right. You can't just say, oh, this is a wonderful plan, but what are we going to do about it? And, you know, how are we going to implement it? And, and so on. And um, you know, one of the members of the committee, for example, is a man I I hired to replace me as director of the Kaptan Center. His name is Wasim, Wasim Kurti. And uh, Wasim was very actively involved in draft. And he knows the problems. And he knows that you know you can do little things and gradually build up to a, so. Um, I was fascinated by your talk. I didn't really know much about uh, education in Palestine. And one word, I don't know if you regard this as encouraging, but many of the problems you mentioned are also problems with our education yes, yes. here in America. And particularly you mentioned the problems of the dignity and uh, punitive treatment of teachers. So yes, yes. Uh, this is something that seems to go with bureaucracies and governments uh, elsewhere. Um, I don't know if this is really relevant, but I was in Jordan just before the Second Intifada, and people were telling me about the education there, and that, it, that, that the curriculum was very skewed, and it was not producing the kind of graduates that were needed to solve the unemployment problems and so on. And one reason they gave is that the women were controlling what subjects the, uh, their children majored in. Uh, you know, they liked poetry and, and, <laughs> <laughs> and being lawyers. And I just wondered, um, is, is, you didn't get down to the nitty gritty of the, the curriculum, but is that also a problem, in, in not the mothers, but the uh, direct, you know, the concentration and the encouragement of majors and is STEM education getting any uh, some, some, support? Uh, in, some, in some schools, yes. Uh, but the problem goes deeper there. It's not really the fact that women are in control. No, that's the, excuse me. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I know, I know. But uh, the problem is deep, deeper than that. Uh, most Arab governments, and Jordan in particular, were willing to concede education, the running of education, to the Islamic fundamentalists. You know, for some strange reason, they thought if they were going to mess up, let them mess up there, which is absolutely the wrong thing to do. But in any case, so it's really, um, you know, doing things that are safe. Safe. Because ultimately, you know as well as I do that, uh, that education is an instrument of control in most countries, including this one. And, uh, and, and we, you know, we teachers engage in guerrilla warfare in order to sneak something in within the system of control. You know, it's, it's a war between, between us and them, so to speak. But uh, so I, yeah, I think that's really where the problem lies, the ex conceding education to Islamic fundamentalists, um, which is unfortunate. And that's why I wanted to emphasize science education, um, because I see science education as the first line of defense against obscurantism and religious intolerance. Um, and I, I think it's important. I remember when I first came to Ramallah to run, to run this uh, project, there was a, an eclipse. And uh, the radio was constantly talking about, and television, quoting experts who terrified people about the eclipse. Don't, F, don't go outside and don't do this. And blah. People were terrified. On the day of the eclipse, I go to the grocery store, and nothing is open. Everything is closed, shuttered. It, a mile down the road in, in the Israeli side, everything was normal. So we decided to go to Abu East to visit my uncle's family. So we go there, and I pull in the driveway, and I see the curtain all drawn and uh, sheets of paper on the, on the windshield of the car. So I, we go in and say, what, what's going on here? No, no, we don't want any reflections coming in from you. you know, they had people terrified, terrified. So, um, you know, science education, <laughs> I, I determined if, if I do nothing in this place, <laughs> I want to spread some science literacy among people. And, uh, and I... Play a role in the curriculum? Yes, absolutely. Abs absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. That's, to me, it's, it's extremely important to us. It's, it's vital, science, scientific literacy. Yeah, um, thank you for this really fascinating talk. My question pertains to academic BDS. So I know a lot of schools are trying to implement this rule where Israeli students can't come study abroad at their universities because it's a part of the BDS um, movement. And then from the other perspective, it's like, no, you shouldn't, um, not a lot, well, you shouldn't ban Israeli students because you're exposing them to like Western ideals and like kind of a different perspective from what they're taught in Israel. In my opinion, uh, I was wondering what your opinion of I, the I, academic I BDS movement is. I think uh, I think that uh, I think this is very silly. Uh, there are different definitions, different ways of looking at at, at the BDS, uh, and I think there may be people who think that way. Uh, but I think it's wrong. Uh, we need to be um, to target those institutions in Israel that are related to the occupation. And uh, it's, you know, I, uh, there are many academics in Israeli universities who are very sympathetic to us. I find their work to be much more meaningful than anything that I see on our side. And should we boycott them? No, absolutely not. In the end, we're going to live with these guys. In the end, we're going to live the same with the same with these people. You know. It's interesting, when I was setting up this center, and I needed some experts to come in from the outside, you know, I, I looked around, and I uh, ended up getting mostly British and French and 
Scandinavian. Um, but the best people that I could have gotten were two miles down the road from me in Tel Aviv. But I couldn't. I couldn't do it. But imagine if the situation were normal, what kind of joint work we could have done with these people to get them involved in it. Because they've done incredible things in, in education in that country. And uh, so, uh, you know, in the end, we have to live with these guys. And uh, to, to punish students for coming to, that's silly. Thank you for your presentation. I'm always fascinated by the sizable portion of the Israeli population that are Arabs. And I'm wondering if any individual Arabs in that population is supporting your efforts, either teaching, consulting, providing yes, funds, yes, yes. books? Yes. We, we, we consider our target population to be Palestinians no matter where they are. And uh, we, are, we are involved with, with them. We go there and they come. Uh, many of them attend the summer school in drama and education in Jarash. Uh, no, we, uh, we, we, we're, we're very much, uh, we, we make no distinction. We are one people. All right, well, thank you very much. <laughs>